Hello, one and all. Welcome to another stream. And this evening, I'm feeling the mood to do some more counter apologetics. So strap in. We're going to be looking at a new channel that I've just uh, found out about called, uh, was it Deflate? I'm not sure what the origin of that name is. But anyway, I guess it makes a change. And the video that I'm going to look at to start with is uh, oop, this one. How Women and Coca-Cola Prove the Resurrection. So with a title like this, I couldn't help but have a look. And it's a short one as well. So um, we'll have a look at what he has to say here. And maybe I'll do a couple of others depending on how I'm feeling. Um, yeah, let's just make a start then. Have to do with the resurrection oh, of Christ. Let's make sure. What on earth does Coca-Cola have to do with the resurrection of Christ? Well, way more than you may think, as I'm about to show you in this video. I'm going to offer you what might literally be the sweetest argument for the resurrection of Christ. So, cheers. Hi, my name is Lucas, and well sponsored. <laughs> Welcome to my channel, Deflate, where I challenge the skeptic, strengthen the believer, and create a space for awesome discussions about the God who raised Jesus from the dead. Let's imagine for a moment that you want to publish an article aimed at making people believe that Coca-Cola is the healthiest drink ever. How would you build your case in order for it to have maximal impact? Here's a couple of suggestions. You could get a study done by a respected chemistry lab, which ends up showing how Coca-Cola's chemical building blocks positively affect the human body. Or you could interview medical doctors who point out the beneficial effects of Coca-Cola. And of course, you could point to celebrities who endorse Coca-Cola and pay them to talk about their newly discovered love for Coke as the go-to thing for mental health and physical well-being. Now, of course, no matter how hard you'd try to tell people that Coca-Cola is the real health deal, we all know that when it comes to the actual facts, your case is lost from the very outset. Even so, if for some reason you want to... Wait, wait, wait. What, why is your case lost? Uh, I think I missed that, right? Because, I mean, maybe Coke is uh, not an example of this, but lots of industries <laughs> have told their customers for a long time that their products are either good for them or good for the environment or whatever, even though it's, you know, not true. The tobacco industry would be a clear example of this that, you know, just denied the evidence for decades and just, you know, published their own in-house studies and muddy the waters and so forth. Fossil fuel industries would be a more recent example of that with respect to the environment, not with respect to personal health, I guess. But I mean, I guess the point I'm making here is you can just kind of make stuff up and this is the technique of called the big lie. If you just keep saying something repeatedly over and over again, loudly enough, um, and you know, with flash of graphics, celebrities, or whatever else, or prestigious sounding uh, studies and such, can also help. Then you know, a lot of people will just believe it. Um, so, I mean, this is kind of relevant, as you'll see later. But it, it's actually not that hard to get people to believe something, if especially if you get, you know, you've got money behind you and you just sort of keep saying it. I, I don't know that this is like super relevant to his point exactly but i just think it's interesting that he's using this example as if it would be like hard to do uh to convince people of of something even though it's not true but it, we i mean it, we kind of have lots of cases where it, where that's exactly happened but anyway let, let's keep going to, to go forward with publishing your article a key thing to build a convincing case is this mention trustworthy witnesses like scientists for example cite respectable sources, a magazine like Nature, for example, and refer to authorities people take seriously, like medical doctors. Now from Coca-Cola to the cross of Christ. Shortly after Jesus died, his disciples started telling people that he physically arose from the dead. Of course, if you're a skeptic, you'll say that this is far crazier than claiming that Coca-Cola is healthy. The resurrection simply cannot have happened. And so surely, for whatever reason, the disciples must have made up the story. Yes, it is possible that, possible that they made it up. But the real question is not whether it's possible that they made it up, but whether it's plausible that they did so. Now, here's the thing you want to consider. When the gospel authors wrote down this story, all four of them unanimously said that the key eyewitnesses of the resurrection were women. Why is this significant? Well, you need to know that in the world of first century Judaism, women weren't actually held in high esteem. That's why rabbinic tradition records that women's wisdom. 
You'd think if God was revealing his uh, will and, and all-powerful, uh, you know, all good nature to the Israelites, that they might have taken a bit more notice of the fact that, you know, surely God would have made it abundantly clear, 100%, no doubt that men and women were completely equal. Um, obviously, he kind of dropped the ball on that one because, the, you know, the, the Jews at that time were pretty strict, at least, I mean, many of the observant Jews were pretty strict about the idea of, you know, keeping the dietary laws and no other God before me and no graven images and all that because, because you know, Yahweh was was pretty clear about those things, uh, like gender equality. You know, I guess you know it's it's about the interpretation and the cultural context and this other stuff. And I guess he just wasn't quite clear enough about that. Anyway, I just I think it's interesting that they sort of apologists like to point this out that women weren't respected that much, or at least their testimony wasn't in in the Jewish culture of the time. But what like whose fault is that? Like, isn't Yahweh supposed <laughs> supposed to be giving them their their commandments and and uh, his his all good moral nature sort of wearing off on them at least to some extent? I don't know. I I think that aspect is sort of neglected. But it, it that's a tangent. But look, let's keep going. System is solely in the spindle, and that the words of Torah should be burned rather than entrusted to women. On top of that, women were considered so unreliable and untrustworthy that they were not to testify in a court of law. Thus, the most important Jewish historian Josephus states, let not the testimony of women be admitted on account of the levity and boldness of their sex. This means that back in the day, if you wanted to publish a fake story aimed at making people believe that Jesus rose from the dead, the one thing you would definitely not do is make women your key witnesses. Instead, in your attempt to get maximum credibility, you would make a man, or even better, a group of men, or even better still, a group of well-known and respected men your key source, but definitely not women. And so you need to ask yourself the following question. If the story of the resurrection is made up, why is it told the way it is? Why would the gospel authors make up a case that is built on the word of women if they knew perfectly well that this would make the whole thing a non-starter in the eyes of their contemporaries? Why would the writer... Oh, okay. I'll leave it there because... I want to end thing, with this question. A non-star. All right, there we go. So there's our question. Why would the gospel authors make up a case that is built on the word of women when they knew this would make it a non-starter because no one trusted, or at least Jews didn't trust the word of women? Well, let's have a little think about this. Put our skeptic caps on. I always wear mine, of course, but you might need to grab yours out of the cupboard or whatever, dust it off perhaps. Let's think about this. So we've got early tradition that a number of Jesus's male followers pretty much exclusively as far as I know, claim to have seen him after he died. Okay, so we get this from, for example, um, 1 Corinthians 15 with Paul and uh, I guess other traditions that later end up in the Gospels. Okay, so your Mark, the earliest Gospel writer that we know, uh, I mean, maybe there are probably other Gospels as well, but we don't have those. So Mark's the earliest one we that's extant, okay? And you're sitting down to write a, a gospel, a story of the life and teachings of Jesus. And you know from these traditions that are well attested and early that, uh, you know, Jesus's male followers saw him after after he died and, you know, he preached to them and so forth. The trouble is you don't have an, a story about his actual resurrection from the tomb uh, that's anything like that early. M maybe you've ha you've heard whispers or you, the, people have put out their theories, but but there just isn't a tradition that goes back, um, you know, that's anything like as well attested. But you can't just leave that out of the story, right? I mean, that's kind of important. Like the whole thing is the fact that Jesus conquers death and he raises from the tomb on the on the Sunday morning, right? Um, so you've got to have something in there to put in your gospel. So what do you do, right? You don't have that tradition. Uh, and you know that your audience knows that that tradition isn't solid or perhaps didn't exist at all, but you still want to put something in there to flesh out your gospel, right? So what do you do? What would you make up to put in there if you were in this position, right? Specifically, if you're if you're Mark. Now, um, I forget the guy's name who made this video, so I'm just going to call him Deflate. He, he did tell us, but I've forgotten. Uh, so Deflate here is telling us that Mark would not have made up women as the original people who saw Jesus come out of the tomb because no one would trust their testimony. But the thing is, if you're making up this story or perhaps embellishing, let's say embellishing, let's say harmonizing, actually, let's making up such a, a derogatory word, harmonizing existing 
uh, fragmentary oral tradition. So you're harmonizing existing fragmentary oral traditions to form an account that you're going to write in the gospel, right, to, to you know promote people's faith and so forth. Um, what are you going to put there? Well, obviously, you've got to explain why they've never heard this before, or at least not in the way that you're telling it. Why is it that they never heard this particular story of, you know, Jesus coming out of the tomb on the Sunday morning and whatever other details you're putting into it? Um, so you, you, whatever you've got to write has to be consistent with that. So Mark scratching is like, well, you know, I've got to say something about, uh, you know, how he was actually resurrected on the morning, but but there's no firm account there. So, I mean, I can't just, you know, write all this stuff and p people won't believe it. And then it comes to him. It must have been women who discovered the empty tomb and who first saw Jesus, because that would explain why no one's heard of it before, or at least not heard much about it before, because, of course, no one would have believed the women. And just to hammer the point home, Mark actually comes up with the idea that what must have happened is that women saw uh, found the empty tomb originally and Jesus even told them not to tell anyone so it's a double reason why no one's heard of this story women reported it and of course no one trusts them anyway plus Jesus even told them not to tell anyone I mean obviously they did right but but maybe they told them later or some of them didn't tell different stories or whatever so, so you know that that kind of covers it up a bit as to why no one's heard this before so it's a double whammy of reasons which include uh, as to why you would write it this way because obviously it's not in the oldest tradition but you want to put it in there so this is must this must have been how it went right it must have been the women ah oh, solves this problem we've harmonized the story so you're mark and you you write that down now, when it comes to Matthew and Luke, who write later, well, they've got Mark open right before them. And so they're just, you know, they're just writing what he he's put. Maybe there's other traditions that they're um, incorporating, uh, excuse me, harmonizing, that they're harmonizing existing traditions. And so their stories are a little bit different, but, you know, they've still got the women as well. So I think we can tell a fairly plausible story as to why they would have made up, no, not made up, harmonized existing fragmentary narratives to as to why women would be the per first people who found the term, because otherwise, why wouldn't people have already heard of the story? If you're making up a story, you've got to also tell not only what happened, but why people haven't heard of it before. And having women find the term nicely fits that. Now, I should add, I don't think this story was made up by gospel authors. I think that it's plausible that women did find the empty term. But maybe I'll mention that a little bit later. But So I'm just responding to this question here. It's as if some people who are Christians just never think about this from any other perspective other than their own. It's like, but why would you make this stuff um, with women in it? Well, let's see. Can we think of a reason? Turns out it's actually trivially easy to think of a reason. Imagine that. Let's continue to finish out the video in the eyes of their contemporaries. Why would the writers frame the story in a way that makes it the least credible? As I said, it is possible that the gospel authors made it all up. But again, what matters is not possibility, but plausibility, because a whole lot of things are possible if you just give it enough thought. You know, maybe Coca-Cola's management is really trying to serve you the healthiest drink on the planet. I mean, yeah, it's possible because at the end of the day, we don't know what's going on in the minds of their CEOs. However, given all the facts we do know, the idea simply isn't plausible. Let me suggest to you that... Not very plausible. The idea that when people are making up a story... They need to make it up in a way that people will have a justification for why they haven't heard it before. Not very plausible. Mm, there you go. At the exact same thing applies when it comes to the biblical account of the resurrection. It is possible that the gospel authors made it up. Wait, th did he say what I think he said? Given all the facts we do know, the idea simply isn't plausible. Let me suggest to you that the exact same thing applies when it comes to the biblical account no, of the he, resurrection. He did, say it. did you catch this? Exact same thing applies when it comes to the biblical account. The biblical account of the resurrection. The biblical account. The way I count it, there are four biblical accounts of the resurrection. There's one in Mark, there's one in Matthew, there's one in Luke, and there's one in John. And they're all different. I mean, I'm not going to belabor that point there. You can look at um, Bart Ehrman, who makes the point far more eloquently than I can with his much greater basis of knowledge for all of the differences there. Now, of course, you can harmonize them. Anyone can harmonize them. Harmonizing is super easy, right? The point, though, is this is the sleight of hand. You have four different accounts which agree on some points but differ on many, many others, and you just sort of slip it together, and now there's somehow one biblical account. 
Well, there isn't one biblical account. There's four of them. They're not independent of each other, but they are also distinct. I think this is actually important here because it just shows the way this is being thought about. It's not being thought about in the way that it should be, which is to look at these as four distinct, although related, historical accounts and try to understand why they are the way they are. But it's the biblical account, which... I mean, is almost presupposing the whole point of it, right? Like, it, why would you view it as a totality unless you already have a reason to? Like, unless there's something special about these four accounts uh, and not any other accounts, like, you know, non-canonical gospels or, or other reports. I, I mean, you know, I'm making a lot of po a lot on that one word there, but I actually think it matters because it really shapes the way you're thinking about this. If you're already thinking about it as a the biblical account, then I, I suggest that you've sort of already decided your answer, as opposed to let's see what these four accounts have to say and then consider that on the basis of, you know, all of the other evidence and considerations of the resurrection. It is possible that the gospel authors made it up. We don't know all the facts, but for those facts we do know, particularly when it comes to the fact of the women taking the central stage in the story, the suggestion that this thing is made up simply isn't plausible anymore. Instead, a far more plausible option is this. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John wrote down what they did because while they were fully aware that a bunch of women witnessing a resurrection would make for the dumbest sounding story ever, that was the only thing they could actually tell because it was the very thing that happened. Another crazy story is the one over... Well, we'll just uh, jump back from that a bit. Okay, so the best explanation, the more plausible explanation is that the authors of the Gospels could only write that the women found the empty tomb because that's what they knew happened. That's interesting because that's obviously not the only possibility, right? Let's suppose the Gospel authors did have very reliable, I don't know, direct evidence, eyewitness testimony or whatever, even prior documents, if you like, ab about who found the empty tomb. It doesn't follow that they had to put it in the narrative, does it? I mean, they could have just left that out. They could have emphasized other aspects of it, for instance. They could have harmonized it in a way to emphasize the characteristics and the theologically relevant parts. So, so it, the point I'm making here is it, the fact that they knew that that was the case, just supposing that they did, right? It doesn't follow that they would write that. So it, it doesn't it doesn't really make sense as an explanation for why it's there. I actually think the explanation I offered is a lot more plausible that even though I not necessarily I don't necessarily agree that, that that is what happened, right? I just in terms of if you're asking this specific question, why did why did they report the women find the tomb? Or maybe it's because they needed to give an account as to why no one had heard this before, at least not in that way that Mark presents it, being the first gospel author. And I think this really harmonizes well or fits well with the fact that Mark reports that Jesus telling the women not to tell anyone, right? That this again further report as to well, why have we not heard this? Oh well the women weren't supposed to tell anyone but you know, I guess it's leaked out at some point and, and now we've got the full story or whatever. Um, or maybe it was revealed separately. I, I don't know what they would have thought about that. But 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 you see, like that actually tries to give an account as to why it's women, because there's a logic to it as opposed to, well, that's what happened. Uh, that, that Just because it's happened doesn't mean that they would actually include the detail or that it would appear the way we do. Sorry, it would appear the way it does. Anyway, um, it's also just weird here that, as people mentioned in the chat, it's just assumed that either it's true or it was made up. True or made up? Hmm, are those the only options? I guess so. Like if someone believes something, either they made it up or it's true. That Like there's no other way that someone can hold a belief about something. Could it po be possible that the gospel authors thought that the women discovered the tomb empty, but they actually didn't? Or could it be possible that the women really did discover the tomb empty, but Jesus wasn't resurrected? So let me, let's think about this together. Come now, there's a reason to get us together, save the Lord. If I go to a cemetery and I find a tomb, then I expect to have a body in it that's actually empty. There's no body there. What's the most plausible inference I should make? Here's a couple of options. One, the body wasn't actually buried there. I just got the information I was given was incorrect. Two, the body had been there, but it was removed on proper authority for various reasons. Three, the body had been buried there, but was stolen or removed on improper authority. Four, the body had been buried there, but was miraculously resurrected by the Lord God of the universe. Which of the four do you think is the best explanation? Okay, so maybe that's hard because I know this is pretty controversial in some quarters. So let's consider a different example, which might make this a bit easier. Let's say you've been shopping and you go to the parking lot where you thought you left your car, but your car is not in fact there. Let's consider what the possible explanations are. One. 
you thought you parked your car there, but actually you didn't. You got confused or made a mistake. Two, you did park your car there, but the car was removed on proper authority. So, for example, it might have been towed because you were parked uh, in the wrong position or perhaps there was some emergency they needed to move it. Three, you did park there and it was removed on improper authority. Basically, it was stolen. Or four, your car was removed miraculously from its location by the Lord God of the universe for his own purposes. Which of those four explanations do you think is the most plausible and which do you think is the least plausible? I'll let you have a think about that. So may I suggest that the one that you rank as the least plausible should be both. It should be the same in both cases, because saying that the Lord God of the universe did something like that is not a good explanation because the Lord God of the universe could do whatever he wants, but most of the time it seems that he doesn't do anything and just lets things happen the way they would ordinarily happen. So whenever you are faced with any phenomenon that seems a bit odd, such as a body being absent from a tomb you thought it should have been in, you should almost never go with the Lord God of the universe decided to move it for some reason. You'd have to have pretty darn good reason for thinking that that was plausible outside of merely the fact that, you know, well, it's not there now. So the point there is that it could well be that the tomb was actually empty. That doesn't mean that the women uh, actually saw the resurrected Jesus. So there's a few considerations there that I think are quite plausible uh, or a reasonable response from the skeptic. Now, let's can keep playing this because I think this will provide some interesting fodder for maybe the next video to look at. Because it was the very thing that happened. Another crazy story is the one over here. It's about a skeptic who thought that he'd never ever change his conviction that prayer doesn't work, but ended up doing exactly that after making a pretty cool experience. Click over here, don't forget to subscribe, and thank you for watching. Like and subscribe. Apparently prayer can turn uh, like squares into triangles. That's pretty interesting. So let's, we, I gotta have a look at this. It's been around a year since a close friend of mine oh. changed his mind 180 degrees from saying that prayer is not <laughs> At least he said 180 degrees. I like it when people say he, he did a complete 360. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's just an amusing, amusing slip of the tongue. But anyway, let's see what this story is about. Nothing but a mental exercise to admitting that God really does answer prayer as a result of something that happened to him, which he never expected. In this video, I'll tell his story, and if you're wondering whether prayer actually works, you should totally watch this. However, if you're thinking that I'm trying to prove to you that God answers prayer, you're mistaken. Camille, when was the last time there was something truly novel in apologetics? Bacon. Instead, the real point of my story is far more surprising and challenging than you may think. So keep watching till the end. Hi, this is Lucas, and the point of this Lucas, channel is I'll to challenge to the skeptic, that. strengthen the believer, and to create a space for awesome discussions about god right so th that's actually interesting there um he said that the purpose of this channel is to challenge the skeptic strengthen the believer and promote awesome conversations about god so i've no problem with challenging the skeptic obviously i'm a skeptic i like being challenged that's good strengthen the believer and i don't necessarily have a problem with that either you know if you think that christianity is true then you want to strengthen other people in their belief don't necessarily have a problem with that in principle depends you know there's details there but what i think is interesting is that you don't want to challenge the believer right why would you not say you know challenge everyone or challenge the skeptic and the believer and then strengthen the believer like you know again am i nitpicking i don't think so because this is i, I hear this a lot or something similar it's like you strengthen the believer or reinforce it and then you challenge the people who are, who are disagreeing with you instead of the way that you know logic and reason and evidence should be used which is to challenge everyone and to get everyone to respond to that Everyone should be challenged by, you know, difficult questions or philosophical issues and, and so forth. So I just think that <laughs> the idea that you don't want to challenge believers is, is kind of interesting. Anyway. Hit subscribe and the bell and become part of the community. So my friend. Like and subscribe, smash that like button. Let's call him Tom here, is a regular member at our Bible study for skeptics in downtown Beirut. He's an introspective type of guy and at the same time, extremely Oops. smart. Which yeah, sorry, you missed it. Whenever mind. he didn't... opens his mouth to say something, you can be 100% sure that what you're about to hear has been really well thought through. Now, before COVID-19, we would go out for lunch once a month or so at the Burger King just around the corner from my office. And usually, Tom would show up with a... 
Wait, so the previous video we had, I didn't think of this, we had Coca-Cola. Now we've got Burger King. I, I, I'm really getting sponsored by, see, like, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not serious, but it's just, a, you know, it's an interesting coincidence there. I wonder, wonder what the next one will be. List of philosophical questions about God, and we would talk through them. Now, one time as we were talking over our burgers and fries, Tom revealed the following. You know, overall, Christianity does look rational, but I have a list of specific things that prevent me from actually believing in it. My immediate response was to ask, well, what's on the top of that list? Now, that's not my immediate response. If someone said to me, if someone was a skeptic who always said well thought through things, and then they came to me and said, I think Christianity is, is rational, my first question would be, what do you think is rational about it or, or something to that effect? Because even a lot of Christians don't agree with that. I mean, I guess not apologists, right? But, you know, who was it? Was it Tertullian? Camille will correct me if I'm wrong here. Who, who said, I believe because it is absurd. Um, you know, there's a, there's a there's a long strand of tradition there that, um, that would go against this idea that, you know, it's rational or makes sense or whatever. But anyway... Um, Let's see where this leads. He replied, it's prayer. I just can't believe that prayer works. It may be nice as a mental exercise that helps people to feel better about themselves, but I simply can't believe that God, if he exists, would really intervene in our world. He also said that he's absolutely convinced of his position and that he can't imagine ever changing his mind about it. I told Tom... Well, he's not a very good skeptic then. A skeptics are always open-minded about the possibility of being wrong about things, even if they think it's very unlikely. So if you ever hear someone say they're absolutely convinced of something, they can't imagine how they could ever change their mind about it. I mean, you know, maybe if it's one plus one equals two, then that might be one thing. But but something about like prayer, where it's whenever God comes into it, I don't think you can be absolutely convinced of anything. So I, oh, I mean, I am not saying this story is falsified, right? All I'm saying is that this is a classic um, avowal of Christ skepticism, uh, which I've talked about uh, before as a very common motif when anyone is trying to uh, advocate for any sort of claim that's likely to meet hostile skepticism. They'll find either for themselves or they'll find someone else who initially is a skeptic, then something happened and now they're a believer. So th this is a very, um, it, it fits, it, what you'll see here, it fits exactly to that pattern, right? And so one wonders how much harmonization has occurred in the facts here. And when someone says, oh, they were such a skeptic, but then I hear, but they said that they were absolutely convinced and there was no way they could imagine even being wrong. You know, I'm like, well, that doesn't sound like a very skeptical thing to say. I mean, you know, maybe you can't just judge on one sentence, but you know, things like that lower my confidence that the person was what I would regard as a, well, a good skeptic. And a good skeptic, I would say, doesn't say things like that, or at least very reticently would say anything of that sort. Home the following right away. You know, we could talk through this question of whether God answers prayer the way we talk through other questions. But really, I don't believe that me giving you arguments or even sharing my personal experiences will be helpful in any way. Instead, the only thing that could ever make a difference is if you have an experience with prayer. He agreed and thought that this made sense, but he asserted in the same breath, yet again, that he really can't imagine how anything in the world could ever change his mind. Now so another non-skeptical attitude, a good skeptical person acknowledges that their personal experiences are subject to many biases and distortions and, and motivating factors, and that they, I mean, obviously are relevant, but can't be relied on as, as you know, good evidence for things like does prayer work, just as they can't be relied on for like does homeopathy work or um, similar situations like that. That's why we need, you know, randomized controlled trials. That's why we need scientific evidence. That's why we need uh, controlled circumstances to, to be able to ass assess these things. So if someone says, well, you know, I'll believe in prayer if God answers one of my prayers, I mean, you know, maybe a certain prayers that would work for, but but, but if it's something that's just specific to them, that, that's really not a very skeptical response to take because th th there's no way you can actually tell if that's not just sort of you fooling yourself. You, 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 that's not a controlled situation. So again, not a very skeptical attitude being taken there, I would argue. I've got to be real honest with you here. I wasn't confident that anything significant was going to happen to Tom. In fact, I thought it more likely that nothing would happen and that this issue about prayer would just hang around between us unresolved. And I didn't like the thought of that. You know, I have now this is really interesting here. Let me just rewind that. So, uh, so, uh, dang it, come on. What's his name? Lucas. Lucas here is telling us about a friend of his whom apparently he respects a lot and is intelligent and uh, I imagine sort of a thoughtful, honest person given the characterization he's given. So, his friend, um, so he's challenging his friend to pray, um, and 
he is hoping that his friend will have some sort of positive experience that will, uh, you know, open him up to Christianity. Okay. Now, if Christianity were true and you really believed in it, I mean, I'm not saying Lucas doesn't, right? But like, if you really believe all the claims, wouldn't you expect him to have a positive experience with prayer? Okay, maybe it would take a couple of times, you know, show he's really sincere. But why wouldn't that happen? Like, isn't that what the God, what, the God, isn't that what God is in the business of doing? <laughs> you know, you know, helping people to come to a realization that he is, you know, the one, the loving, the true God, you know, the beginning, the end, the Alpha and the Omega and all that stuff. Like, why wouldn't you expect that? That, that doesn't make any sense to me. Like, he, well, and, and this is what he says. In fact, I thought it more likely that nothing would happen and that this issue about prayer would just hang around between us. So Lucas thinks that when, and apparently, as far as I can tell from the story, an honest, sincere, thoughtful seeker prays at the request of a Christian, he Lucas thinks that nothing will happen. <laughs> that is bizarre. What is God doing if he doesn't do, you know, if, if he's not answering prayers like that? I mean, obviously he does sometimes, right, as we'll see here. But Lucas didn't expect it. What sort of worldview do you have where where God is there and can answer prayers, but you don't expect that he will, even in these favorable circumstances? I'm flabbergasted as to why you wouldn't expect this. As a Mormon, granted, some different theology, but I expected God to answer prayers in, circ in analogous circumstances. It may take some persistence, but there is an expectation that he will do that. No, I mean, he, he, he didn't, right? <laughs> he, he doesn't. But but that's the expectation. That's what the theology teaches. And if the theology doesn't teach that, then, like, what's God doing? Like, it's just kind of, he wants everyone to choose to love him and come into a relationship with him. But when people earnestly seek him, he's like, nah. But like, what? <laughs> I, it just doesn't make any sense to me. But anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll see more discussion of this in a bit. Unresolved. And I didn't like the thought of that. You know, I have a few close friends who say that if they just saw God intervene in their lives, they would actually believe. And I would love to see God do exactly that for them. But I must say that in many cases, I'm still waiting for it to happen, which is something I kind of struggle with. And it leaves me wondering sometimes, why wouldn't God just do it? You know, I've... Good question. I actually talked about this issue in more detail in my recent interview with William Lane Craig. So if you wrestle with the same thing, check it out here, I think. Oh boy! So let me let let me see if I can channel Craig here. I haven't watched that specific video, but let's see if I can guess what what Craig would say. And people can maybe let me know in the comments if if I'm correct. So the question is something like, why doesn't God answer the prayers of of every seeker or something like that? <clears throat> well, what you have to understand is that God has what is sometimes called middle knowledge. So this is a position called Molinism. Under Molinism, God doesn't just know what you will actually do in the future, but he also knows what every free creature will choose in every possible world. And it could be the case that God has actualized the world in which the largest number of free agents choose freely to follow him. And it could be the case that God knows that your friend would choose to reject him even in worlds in which God revealed himself and answered the prayer. And so in God's infinite wisdom, he has actualized the world that brings the largest number of free agents into communion with himself. And therefore, I don't think it's surprising that in this world we see God fail to answer many prayers because that is what we would expect under a God who created a world to maximize the number of free agents who choose to accept him. Yeah, that was my crappy American accent. Uh, but anyway, uh, to answer to answer this. So that's what I've heard Craig say in other circumstances. So maybe that is um, different to what he said there. But anyway, let us continue. Because so he doesn't talk about that here. How Tom and I departed from Burger King that day. Him convinced that prayer doesn't work and that nothing will ever change his mind. And me with serious doubts that the only thing that could ever change his mind would ever actually happen. Then some three weeks later at our weekly Bible study in Starbucks, we read a passage which was all about prayer. And for most of the evening, our discussion centered around the question of whether human free will and the idea of God responding to prayer is compatible with divine omniscience. Tom was mostly silent throughout the discussion, but at the very end, he said, guys, you all know that I've been suffering from this brain condition and God simply hasn't done anything about it, even though people have prayed for me, which is why I've come to the conclusion that prayer just doesn't work. 
So yes, Tom has suffered from this thing, which would often cause him intense headaches, insomnia, and all sorts of other awful consequences. Depending on weather and other conditions, his pain would be super intense at some times, while being somewhat more bearable at other times. No doctor has so far been able to diagnose what Tom's sickness is exactly, which is why he has started to study neuroscience by himself in the hope that eventually he'll get to the bottom of his condition. Now, as we wrapped up that Bible study in Starbucks, one of my friends took Tom aside to ask him whether he could say a short... <laughs> Starbucks now? <laughs> it's kind of funny how many of these he mentions. Like, I don't think I've ever mentioned any big brands like that. And we've got three in like two and a half videos, one and a half videos, but anyway. Prayer for him. And Tom gladly accepted because while he was convinced that this wasn't going to make any difference, he was still open-minded enough to go for it anyway. The following week, we were scheduled for our monthly lunch at Burger King. Now, I was there first, waiting for- <laughs> It's Burger King again, and we get the book. <laughs> Just like, <laughs> how many times can you mention it? Oh, dear. Tom in front of the counter. As he walked in, he said hi and directly went on. Hey, Lucas, can I ask you something? I said, sure, go ahead. What is it? He told me. You know, the last two weeks, my headache has been so intense that if I had to pin it down on a scale from zero to 10, zero being no pain and 10 being so painful that you want to kill yourself, I was constantly on a nine. And even though I've been taking very strong medication, I haven't been able to catch even just one hour of sleep a night because my body can't wind down due to the pain. But then on Thursday, George prayed for me and I went home after that. As I arrived, I went up to my room, fell on my bed and slept for 12 hours straight. And since then, every night, I've been sleeping like a log for 12 uninterrupted hours, which is why I stopped my medication. And yet, I'm still enjoying the move for 12 steps for 12 hours straight. And since then, every night, I've been sleeping like a log for 12 uninterrupted hours, which is why I stopped my medication. All right. So, so that part of the story, so I don't want to demean or make fun of this friend's story in any way. It sounds like he had a very serious condition. However... <laughs> I think that this story provides exactly the sort of uh, example as to why this uh, these ideas can be really harmful. Because uh, I just repeated that last part there. Did you catch the part there? His friend was so convinced that something had happened, something special had happened to him that he stopped taking his medications. Now, if it was just painkillers and he wasn't feeling the need for them, then maybe it's not such a big deal. But, uh, uh, I mean... I don't know from the you know I don't know the details of the case, but you see how that can be concerning, right? If someone believes that they've been healed supernaturally or that God's intervened in some way, then and they just decide to go off their medication, it's I mean I'd assume that they hadn't consulted their doctor, like there's no indication of that. Uh, that's dangerous, <laughs> and you shouldn't do that. And an ideology that promotes that sort of thing or encourages it, even in sort of indirectly, um, it, it is harmful, right? So so that. That right there is, is a real red flag to me. It's one of the reasons why I, I think it's important to push back against this. And yet, I'm still enjoying the most blissful sleep ever. Then he said, and I absolutely love the way he put it, why do you think that is? Now, I couldn't suppress a smile and responded, well, the real question is, why do you think that is? Then we ordered our meals and sat down and talked for at least two hours straight. <laughs> then we ordered our meals at Burger King. <laughs> I don't know why I find that so funny. Just it keeps mentioning it. But anyway, um, also, yeah. So if someone's talking to me about something like that and they ask, why do you think that is? I'd say, well, you should talk to your doctor about this <laughs> instead of, well, why do you think that is? Let's talk about the Bible. Like, it's just, it's manipulative. It's like people are in these terrible situations and then something happens to them. Look, even if God did have something to do with it, you should still tell them to go and talk to their doctor about it, right? Um it's just really dangerous and I think, again, manipulative to, to play on their, uh, their vulnerable situation there to, um, and, and kind of at least tacitly encourage them not to, to, to seek their appropriate medical advice. Great about what happened, why it could or couldn't be explained as a mere coincidence, or why God would answer this prayer but not the prayers of other people who suffer even greater pain than Tom does, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, that's kind of a good question. Why does God answer that prayer, apparently, but not all of these other prayers of people who suffer even more? I, I hope to see him at least, well, discussing that in the three minutes. And I left. got to witness Tom really wrestling with the tension between his hardcore conviction that prayer doesn't work and the powerful experience he just went through. 
And as I said, Tom has a very sharp mind. So he really wanted to make sure he wouldn't give up his conviction before checking out all the options. Ah, well, good. So as a good skeptic, I'm sure he considered all of the other possibilities in terms of, you know, like confirmation bias, because obviously he was seeking and he, he wanted an answer here. And uh, in terms of he was you know motivated to believe that there was something outside the medication that could help him because evidently the medication the doctors weren't working. So there's a very strong personal motivation here. Um, there's also the fact that it could be some uh, combination of um, a suggestive effect, especially if there's a trouble with sleeping, right? If you think that, I mean, I believe they've done studies of this, right? People, um, that, that you know, when people believe that there are people who are care for them and are interested in their well-being, then that has positive effects. Like it's all part of the placebo effect. So, you know, th th this is a bit of just sort of speculation here, not knowing the specifics of the case. But the point is, as a good skeptic, you'd want to think about all of these aspects and make sure that you can really control for these as, as, as well as one can. So let's see how his friend uh, addressed these issues. But the fact of the matter was that Tom saw himself faced with what he thought was quite an overwhelming package of evidence. Not only that, but he has a strong commitment to following the evidence wherever it leads. And so at the end of our conversation, he admitted that there was no escaping the conclusion that he had been wrong about this prayer thing. And that what he experienced was in fact, nothing short of God's tangible intervention in his life in response to prayer. Wait, but what was the, what, why? <laughs> how, how did he, uh, you said that he wanted to avoid all other, you know, other possibilities, but but then you said, oh, we talked about it for a couple of hours at Burger King. A and then he was convinced. Like, well, but what convinced him? I don't understand. A good skeptic is not just going to be convinced over a couple of hour conversation when, when there's all of these other factors, right? They're going to want to look into it and, and, you know, think about it, maybe talk to their doctor. I, I don't, where's the skepticism gone? It's just like, it's just disappeared somehow. And so the last thing I asked him over that lunch was whether we could take off that first item on the list of his objections against Christianity. And I guess I don't have to tell you what the answer to that was. Now, am I saying that this story makes for the perfect proof that God answers prayer? No, I'm not. I'm perfectly aware that you cannot possibly build an entire case based on one personal experience. But this guy did. That's the whole point. I'm sorry. I'm not going to. That's the whole point of this story. The whole point of this story is that you could build an entire case off my personal experience. You just told us a story of your friend who was really skeptical. Then they had a personal experience and then they believed like strongly. Right. <laughs> that is exactly the point of your story. Now, I, I guess you're saying that we shouldn't be convinced because that guy had an experience. OK, fine. But you are saying that you can build an entire case on personal experience, at least if it's your personal experience. And, and, and this is the entire problem with these sorts of things that it, it's not reliable just because it's your experience. Our experiences are very unreliable in many contexts, especially when they're like subjective. I mean, it, this was a classic example of this. It was subjective symptoms, like basically pain and insomnia. I suffer from insomnia, not as bad as this guy did, but there are so many factors that can affect how you, how well, you know, you can get to sleep. And, and you know, you, you are just not a reliable source of um, of uh, evidence about how those different things work because you can't control all of those things and you don't know how that's all affecting your mind, and and that's true for many other types of things as well, not just you know you know insomnia or, or pain, and and so. The idea that you can build this sort of reliable, solid evidence or, or case on the basis of your personal experience is really bad epistemology and really poor skepticism, which is why I don't. I mean, this guy might have this guy may have thought of himself as a skeptic, but based on what I've been told, it doesn't seem to me that he was a very good skeptic. Let's review what we heard. First of all, he said that he was absolutely convinced of his position that prayer doesn't work and, and couldn't imagine any evidence that would convince him otherwise. That's not doesn't sound very skeptical. I mean, maybe you could justify that, but it, it seems implausible to me. Even I would say, <laughs> pretty convinced that prayer doesn't work, that it's possible and I'm not absolutely convinced. You should always allow some doubt. Um, then he, oh, what was the next thing? Um, there was another thing that he said that was um, implausible that, that seemed inconsistent with that. I, I forget what it was. I, oh, yeah, that's right. It, it was saying that that's right. His friend said that he wanted a personal experience of prayer. That's what would make the difference. Again, that doesn't seem the sort of thing that a skeptic would ask for because the skeptic would be aware of the many problems and pitfalls of personal experiences. Then after having that experience, the skeptic reports in a good skeptical fashion that they want to consider all of the possible explanations and, and work through the evidence carefully. Well, that, that's good. That doesn't count against them. But, but then they don't actually do that. They have a two-hour conversation at Burger King. And, and then he's just convinced. <laughs> I, there's no evidence of skepticism here. Okay, so this is really important because the ap apologists talk about the disciples in the same way. They say they were skeptical, but there's no actual evidence of skepticism. Just saying that someone is skeptical doesn't mean that they are. Evidence of skepticism includes... Um, 
evidence that they sought for evidence of claims, like, you know, documentary evidence, physical evidence, uh, expert testimony, you know, r relevant evidence of that. Actual real evidence that you've sought that evidence or that, that they sought that evidence. Um, evidence that they've engaged in serious thinking about alternative explanations for whatever it is that, that you're considering. Attempts to mitigate their own personal biases um, and in-group thinking and, and echo chamber thinking and that sort of thing. Um, so seeking out people who think differently and asking them what they think. That's that's another a thing that, that a skeptic does. Um, taking time to think things through um, and, you know, working it through logically and rashly, not making sort of rash decisions in a, in a small amount of time. That's that's another, I think, uh, good skeptical virtue. And there's probably others as well. Those are just some that come to mind. These are the sorts of things that you should look for when someone is telling you that someone is skeptical. If you don't see a, these sorts of uh, features or behaviors, then be skeptical that they were ever skeptical because it's so easy to say, but you actually want evidence that they were skeptical and not just take it at their word, especially when we think about the very common motif of, you know, a vowel of prior skepticism that has been um, evidence for. Thanks, uh, Peter, for a super sticker. I, I don't exactly know what that means, but I appreciate it. Um, let's I'm also perfectly here. aware that skeptics can and probably will cite all sorts of counter stories in the comments below. You know, how nice that God chose to answer Tom's prayer. But what about the starving children in Africa who don't have their prayers answered? Good question. What about them? Or what about those thousand other times when God didn't answer Tom's prayer? Sure, these questions are totally valid. And as I mentioned... Yes, they are. So let's hear. What, what's some thoughts on them? ...mentioned Tom and I actually talked through them. So let me clarify. So you must have said something very powerful about it to overcome your skepticism. Like, so let's at least have a glimpse of that. And what I am saying in this video... Here's a person who was not only 100% convinced that prayer doesn't work, but also 100% convinced that nothing will ever change his mind. So to say that confirmation bias doesn't apply to Tom's case is quite an understatement. Against yeah, that's not how com confirmation bias works, but anyway. With all odds, Tom did end up changing his mind, and he did come to the conclusion that God does answer prayer, even though he had been convinced that nothing could ever change what he thought was true, which is why... But why did he change his mind? Because you already said that the experience wasn't enough because then he came to you in Burger King and, and talked about it. And, and at the start of that conversation, he wasn't convinced. But after the conversation, he was convinced. So obviously the conversation has something to do with it. So so what did you talk about? Tell us, like, what, what were the key things that you mentioned? Why the real takeaway from my video is this. You might be 100% convinced that God doesn't answer prayer. Now, there is nothing wrong per se with having strong convictions. On the contrary, I think that's a great thing. But the challenge posed by Tom's story is this. If you shared a hardcore conviction against prayer he used to have, you might be next in having that very conviction challenged or maybe even turned around 180 degrees, provided, and this is key, that you go about things with an open mind. Speaking of an open mind, check out this video. In well, I'm disappointed. I was expecting him to let us in some of the secrets that he conveyed in that two-hour discussion at Burger King with his friend there. Uh, but... Apparently, we don't get to hear any of that. Um, I don't know. Maybe they went through it in the interview you had with Craig or something like that. But I'm not in the mood to listen to Craig talk at the moment. So I'm not going to watch that now. Plus, I already kind of know what uh, Craig has to say about these sorts of things. Well, I have to say that was disappointing. Um, and um, really seemed to present a conflicting message. Because on the one hand, he's saying, well, look, one personal story or experience doesn't, doesn't prove anything. But on the other hand, it does. Because this happened to my friend. And maybe it will happen to you as well if you pray or, or something like that. Even though the experience didn't actually change his friend's mind, according to the story, it was his conversation that sealed the deal. But he won't tell us, or he doesn't tell us at least, anything about what he talked about, which is unfortunate. Uh, so a very unsatisfying video there. Um, not that I necessarily expected a lot more, but I mean, this question about why God is so selective in which prayers he answers is the biggest, I think it's the biggest reason about, um, the, the biggest reason to be very skeptical about the idea that God answers prayers, because there's no rhyme or reason that's ever been offered as far as I know about why he answers some prayers, but not others. Um, you know, he helps you find your car keys, but allows, you know, massive famines and diseases and natural disasters to take place and doesn't help all of these people. You know, you can just say, well, God works in mysterious ways and his ways are not our ways and middle knowledge and blah, blah, blah. But that actually doesn't answer any question. That's just saying, well, there's a reason we don't know. Um, not, not, you know, not very convincing. Um, and, you know, if, if I ever do get to meet God, I'd certainly be asking for some pretty good answers as to why he just sort of sits there and apparently does nothing when uh, so many people need his help. Because um, I think, you know, someone in his position as our 
apparent lord and god and creator has an obligation uh, of you know uh, to exercise appropriate jurisdiction if we had if, if you have parents in charge of children or a government in charge of the nation you, you don't just accept that it's like oh well you know they have their reasons for not intervening when you know their help is needed that's just not good enough like you have an obligation to do that and i think god does as well and when people are specifically asking for his help and he's just like nah but then like <laughs> it seems like it needs a pretty good reason so uh if it comes to it i'm going to be asking for those reasons but of course i don't think it will come to it because i don't think god exists and i think that's the best explanation for why uh there's no apparent rhyme or reason to why prayers get answered because it's just luck of the draw basically um thanks a lot scott for your uh donation scott lot that's a nice uh name there and also for mitch mazzaroli mazzarol uh, i'm sorry i butchered your name appreciate it now i think i'm in the mood to do one more video so this one is a bit extemporaneous here because i haven't actually selected a second video so if you have a particular uh, from from the same channel here so if you have a preference let that let me know in the in chat in the next i don't know few seconds otherwise i'll just sort of pick one that tickles my fancy probably a short one let's see what we've got here hang on let's go to the full set of videos i see he's been going for about 11 months but he's got, you know, nearly 10k subs. It's pretty good for only about a year's uh, being on YouTube for about a year. So he's doing well for himself. Um, let's see. He's been at Cosmic Skeptic, and again, uh, what's his face? Uh, who am I not interested? Isn't that isn't that Demon Guy? Oh no no no, sorry. That's that's the other Catholic dude. Uh, we did that one. We did the prayer one. I'm not. I don't want to talk about Ravi. Mm, oh, that's only one minute. Another atheist YouTuber, Cosmic Skeptic again. That one's 51 minutes, too long, too long. Atheism, oh, I'm not interested in the whole atheism thing. It's so boring. Slavery, oh, no, I don't want to hear about that. Oh, well, penal to dictionaries to debunk atheism. That sounds fun. Atheism, lack of belief yet again. Why are Old Testament laws so weird? There's the Craig and Craig again. Who created God? Hmm, that one sounds interesting. Maybe I'll have a look at that one. Let me just see what else we've got here. Any favorites in the chat the animal suffering one. Oh, nathan wants me to look at the animal suffering one where's the animal suffering one? Oh wait isn't that wasn't that cosmic skeptic this one is that this one no it's alex's problem he debunked atheism i'm guessing that's it but you put a link there actually but i don't how do i click on that i'll wait for confirmation because i don't want to screw up by clicking the wrong link he's got evolution again Evil disproves atheism. Oh, that's got animals in it as well. Maybe it's that one. Someone let me know here. All right, you said yes. So let's go with this one then. I want to put forward in this video what I think is the hardest objection to respond to if you're a Christian. Cosmic Skeptic recently published a video where he talks about what he believes to be Christianity's biggest problem, the problem of animal suffering. In this video, I'm going to tell you why Alex's case is essentially an emotional appeal that directly contradicts evolutionary theory. But that's not even the half of it. Well, what's wrong with emotional appeals? Craig uses them all the time. Have you not seen his video about meaninglessness without God? I mean, I guess I don't know that this that Lucas agrees with Craig's presentation there, but then he has had him on, so I don't know. Anyway. Because what you're about to witness is how Cosmic Skeptic's biggest shot against Christianity surprisingly turns into his most powerful argument for it. This is going to be very exciting. Hi, my name is Lucas, and... Jeez, that was a creepy... Who does he get these images? ...that directly contradicts evolutionary theory. But that's not even the half of tea. Surprisingly turns into his most powerful argument for it. This is going to be very exciting. <laughs> I don't know why. I just like, such a weird image. Anyway. Hi, my name is Lucas, and this is my channel, Deflate, which challenges skeptics, strengthens believers, and aims to create great conversations about God. Guys, it is super important to me to make clear from the start that I really respect and appreciate Alex, and that everything I'm about to say is meant as an engagement with his worldview, rather than as an attack against him personally. Now, you have to know that the case Alex... So I don't mean to... Like, that's fine. I don't... I don't understand why some people find the need to say that. Like, I, I don't... I just sort of assume that people can gather that when I criticize something, I'm criticizing the argument, not the person, unless I very specifically criticize the person, which I don't usually do. So like, I don't know. It's just one of these things where it's like it, it, in other videos you see it, it's like, oh, everything in this video is just my opinion. It's like, well, what else would it be? Like, I, don't, I just don't. Yeah, anyway, it's just one of these things I think is a bit strange.
Alex puts forward has nothing to do with animal suffering, which is inflicted by humans. Instead, he exclusively focuses on the suffering wild animals endure apart from human involvement. And you're about to hear plenty of examples of that from Alex himself. His claim is essentially that the existence of an all-powerful and all-loving God is implausible given the amount of pain animals have to live with in the natural order created by God. And since there are literally trillions of animals, the problem of animal suffering is, according to Alex, even bigger than the problem of human suffering. Or as he puts it, If the problem of suffering is historically one of Christianity's biggest problems, then the problem of animal suffering is its biggest. Here is how he starts his case. So I should probably begin by unpacking why animal suffering is such a problem worth addressing in the first place. If human life is, as I've argued, infused with pain, then non-human animal life is defined by pain. Okay, let's pause here for a moment. I don't know where Alex gets this idea that animal life is defined by pain. I mean, are we really to believe that the thing that defines a dolphin, a butterfly, or a chimpanzee is the experience of pain? Why is this the ultimate identity marker for what it means to live as an animal? Why not? Yeah, I mean, I think you have to realize that Alex is saying that in a, I guess, figurative way, not literally, oh, it's the definition of animal life that it's pain. I mean, I thought that was pretty obvious um, just listening to that, but anyway. Not the urge to reproduce or the urge to feed. No, it's pain, says Alex, and we're going to see later that this directly contradicts evolutionary theory. But let's indulge Alex for a moment and see why he thinks that pain is the real deal. Animals in the wild are subject to endless torment from all angles of their existence. Yeah, sure, I totally buy that. No, I mean, come on, Wait, seriously? What? Does Cosmic Skeptic really think that we're going to fall for his emotional appeal Wait, that all animals from the moment they're born until they die are endlessly tormented? Man, and I always thought Alex doesn't believe in hell. Yeah, I mean, look at these, the torment is tremendous. Or here, torment from every angle of their existence. I mean, consider that while you're watching this video, every wild animal is being tormented every single second of its life. God is so mean. But Alex isn't done yet. They suffer from predation by other animals. Wild dogs disembowel their prey. Venomous snakes cause slow internal bleeding and paralysis. Crocodiles drown large animals in their jaws. Now, the topic of predation features very prominently in Alex's talk. And he makes a big deal out of the fact that animals can die a violent death as a result of it. I will pick this up later and show you why in his emotional fervor, Alex completely <laughs> misses the point here. Finally. I'm not getting emotional fervor. I mean, I, <laughs> I guess that's a bit subjective, but I don't know. Alex seems pretty straight laced and, and just sort of uh, focused. It doesn't seem emotional. If you want emotional fervor, watch William Lane Craig's video about why life is meaningless without God. There's emotional fervor. That is, ooh, that one is fun. Well, I mean, you know. And animals Good also way. suffer from rampant disease, dehydration, and starvation. This is they emotional fervor, folks. With forest fires and floods <laughs> and a whole manner of other terrifying natural disasters. Oh boy, I mean, yes, you're right. Look at the dehydration these elephants suffer while they are being endlessly tormented by the lack of water. Oh, clearly, Alex is spot on. Now, maybe this... Uh, like, I don't, I, I, don't know. <laughs> I don't understand what Lucas is trying to say here. Like... Obviously, elephants and other animals sometimes have water, but like a lot of time they don't, and then they, you know, they die of dehydration or they're predated and so forth. And clearly, that's the point Alex is making. And that happens a lot. It's a pretty obvious the point, a pretty obvious point that he's making there. Um, I mean, I'm fine with using sarcasm to make a point, but like you've got to have a point. Like what? What? Why start the video with trying to be all nice? Oh, you know, I really respect him, and then. You strawman him ridiculously with this sarcasm that seems like you have no respect for him at all. I, I don't, it's just really strange tone, but also completely lacking a point. Like, it's very obvious what his point, what Alex's point is. Um, <laughs> especially when the subtitles, oh, mate, no, this is, oh, we've just, okay, so I guess he wasn't taking Alex seriously because it was just emotions, but now we're supposed to take him seriously. Even though Alex didn't mention anything emotional, he just said, Animals die of predation. They die of, you know, starvation. They die of dehydration. They die of, I think you mentioned diseases. Like those aren't emotional appeals. Those are just facts. And and he's just he's not. He didn't show lots of images of animals suffering or, of, you know, put music manipulated music up or have him walking around looking sad with all of these, you know, dim lighting and stuff. By the way, that's what Craig does in his video. That's emotional ma manipulation. Like I I don't I don't see that at all. It's just weird. Anyway, let's. Hopefully, we're going to take him seriously now. So let's have a more substantive.
response. This was cheap, I'm sorry, but please allow me to explain myself. First, my point is not to make fun of Alex because he we, cares for animals. Just did not <laughs> I am the truly happy father of a nine-year-old boy, my son Aaron, who has single-handedly organized over 30 kids at his school into a safe green and safe animals advocacy group and leads them in picking up trash and helping worms, bugs, and ants in the school courtyard. I feel nothing but gratitude and respect for the drive he has, and I can honestly say that his passion challenges me. In the same way, the authentic example Alex sets when it comes to caring for animal well-being unsettles me in a very positive sense. In fact, I just found that really strange. It's like, oh, no, I'm not making fun of him for caring about animals. I care about adults, too. My kid keeps worms in a box at school. <laughs> it's like, oh, it picks up trash. It's like, what? Like, to show that you care about animals would be like, I don't know, you donate to animal welfare funds or, like, you're vegetarian, vegan, or you at least ethically source meat or, like, eggs and stuff or that you've, you know, like, done something. Like, that would be some evidence. It's like, oh, my, my kid picks up rubbish at school and keeps worms. It's like, what? Okay, I'm not saying I'm not making fun of his kid. Like, it's just that why would you mention that? It's so it's just such a strange thing as a, as a proof that you care about animals. I mean, anyway, I've told my son Aaron about Alex and I have explained to him that we can learn an awful lot from Alex. Let's save animals. So, yes, that's my son. And again, my point is not to make fun of Alex. But what I want you to catch is this. Alex's case is essentially an emotional appeal that seriously lacks nuance. Now, given that Alex feels passionate about animal well-being, it's only natural for him to throw his emotions into the mix. And oh, this again. Where, where were the emotions? I didn't see them. I just heard him state fairly simple, straightforward facts. Again, no manipulative music, no clips, uh, no images, no finick it with the lighting there was no even really a tone there it was just fairly straightforward i where was the emotional appeal i, I guess you could say he said it was what it was defined by suffering and, and so maybe some choice of language was uh, uh, making emotional appeals i'll grant it was a little bit of that but in the scheme of things in a youtube video that was really very subtle and i <laughs> i think that he's ridiculously overplaying this and look at how much it's a third of the video and he hasn't even responded to anything substantive anyway but let's keep going in fact, I have pointed out in another video that I highly respect Alex for not just engaging in disinterested armchair philosophy, but for actually living out the stuff he talks about. So, yeah, that's a good point, <laughs> Camille. Uh, he's kind of complaining about emotional appeals, so, but who's the one who puts his kid waving to the camera and saying save animals? That is an obvious emotional appeal. That's a classic emotional appeal. So, uh, talk about pot calling the kettle black. My goodness. So my criticism applies not in the slightest to Alex as a person, but to Alex's case, which essentially presents us- Why do you have to mention this again? I, I don't feel the need to continually mention that I'm not critiquing a person when I'm criticizing their argument. Just just criticize the argument. I, I just, I, I, I don't understand why people do that. With a one-sided story replete with emotions. You know, if Alex wouldn't have gone all emotional on us with his talk of the endless torment and insidious levels of unthinkable suffering endured by animals, but presented a factually more accurate picture of how sentient existence actually plays out, his case wouldn't even be half as appealing. Philosophical arguments simply don't work that way, and we are about to see how Alex's ideas directly contradict evolutionary science, which Alex hijacks to make his case. But first, I just want to point out what's at stake here, and this is critical. Remember that, according to Alex, animal suffering is not just any old problem Christianity faces, but it's historically its biggest problem. He claims that it's far easier to explain the tremendous amount of pain plaguing animals against the assumption that an all-loving and all-powerful God does not exist. Now, pause. Think about this. What would we expect to find if we assume that there is no god, and animals in nature are just randomly mutating and evolving and competing for resources with no divine guidance? Well, we'd expect pretty much exactly what we observe in the real world, a messy bloodbath and a struggle for survival. And what would we expect to see if we assumed the existence of an all-loving and all-powerful god? Maybe some level of suffering that we might not be able to fully explain, but nothing even remotely approaching the level of horror and pain that actually exists in the natural world. It is incalculably easier to account for this suffering on an atheistic worldview. Now let's apply Alex's logic to the following hypothetical scenario. Let's say we happened not to find a messy bloodbath and that it was not the case that animal life is defined by pain. But instead, we found a world in which animal life happens to be defined by pleasure. A world in which animals are not endlessly tormented in an earthly hell, but where they are alive and well, healthy and happy and enjoying themselves in a kind of earthly heaven instead. Such blissful animal existence would not, according to Alex's own logic, constitute the biggest problem of Christianity, but the biggest problem of atheism. 
Because if it is incalculably easier to account for the suffering, that is, the horror and pain that actually exists in the natural world, on an atheistic worldview, it also holds that it would be incalculably harder to account for a happy animal existence on an atheistic worldview, and at the same time, incalculably easier to account for it on a Christian worldview. Now, mark these words as we're finally moving from cosmic skeptics' emotional drama to actual what was with that anime there? But yeah, uh, so in terms of what Lucas has said here, I think I basically agree. If if in the animal kingdom we observed what he just, what Lucas just said, that his animals were pretty much like happy mo pretty much all of the time, most of the time, and, and they lived in harmony and, and so on and so on, like the Garden of Eden style, yeah, then I think that would be some evidence in favor of that it was created by uh, an, an all-powerful god or at least some sort of overarching intelligence because uh, you wouldn't really expect that to evolve. I, I, I'm, I'm basically on board with that. So let's see where he's going with this. Scientific theory. I'll be citing an accomplished Austrian academic called Martin Walluch, who has studied applied mathematics, astronomy, physics, and theoretical physics. He has okay. taught and done research at Cambridge and other universities. But there is more, and this will be of particular interest to Alex. One of the PhDs Dr. Baluch holds is on the philosophy of animal rights, and he has moved on to become a prominent animal rights activist in Europe. He's co-founder of what is one of the most influential associations against animal factories in the German-speaking world, the Verein gegen Tierfabriken, which I used to support in my early 20s. Baluch has led countless campaigns for animal now. rights and has received international awards for his efforts. Now here is what he says. Being just back from a trip with a tent into the wilderness, I realized once again the truth of the statement, most wild animals are happy most of the time. I say that because I keep seeing animals in the wild and they almost always seem content and happy. Some are frolicking in the sun, some are playing, some are making love, some are resting and simply enjoying themselves. In only very rare occasions do I see animals who are suffering. Well, I would not have thought this statement to be remarkable, but for some people it is. For people like Alex, you mean? Let's continue. My primary argument for the above statement that most wild animals are happy most of the time is not just my observation, but also from evolution. Being happy is an important psychological state for animals in order to be healthy. A happy animal has not just a much better immune system, he or she is also active and inquisitive. Being happy and content is a vital ingredient to procreate and to live safely and long. Hence, evolution will produce animals who are mostly happy. Of course, if you assume evolutionary theory, this makes complete sense, doesn't it? Happiness is the psychological state most conducive to survival, which is why evolution will produce happy animals, rather than... Hmm. <laughs> well, um... Guess we're wrong, guys. Animals are happy all along because evolution says so. <laughs> I mean, I haven't seen this before, right? I, I, I'm not aware of this particular individual. Uh, otherwise, I would have looked him up beforehand. But so when this guy, let, let's jump back a little bit. This gentleman here, oh, hang on, let's go back a bit further. So, so this is his quote. So when he, what does he say? Oh, wait, I'm going the wrong way. When, oh yeah, being just from back from a trip. I realized once the again the truth of the statement. Yeah, so, so he's gone to... I mean, I don't know where the wilderness is, and he's seen, I don't know, some animals somewhere, and he sees that they're frolicking, and so it, f and he sees that a bunch of times, apparently. I keep seeing animals in the wild, and they almost always seem content and happy. Okay, so question here. How often do you see animals being predated in the wild? I'm gathering you probably don't see that very often because... Like it probably doesn't happen. Like there's probably not a lot of predators in places where humans tend to go, or they probably scare them off. Probably animals who are avoiding predation aren't frolicking around where you can see them. I mean, I'm not a biologist, but you can think of reasons why you might not tend to see uh, the, the predation that happens. Um, also, I have no idea where this guy goes. But and and what about disease? Um, could could you tell if an animal is diseased? Like, I mean. Uh, I've seen animals. Uh, I've seen animals before that have have conditions, and I mean the animal. Like it doesn't know that they're diseased; that they will just they'll just keep doing their thing. So you you might not be able to tell that anything's wrong with them unless you you know looked carefully or had expertise. I I don't like how can a casual observation in selected circumstances of animals that appear to you to be happy count as evidence for anything? I don't I don't understand. So okay, he, 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 here's the story. Alex here has presented some facts about the animal world. Predation is ubiquitous. Disease is ubiquitous. 
Uh, many animals die from lack of resources, like lack of food and shelter and, and water and so forth. Plus, you know, there's um, a changing environments and so forth that they're always having to adapt to. Those are facts, right? Instead of responding to those, what does Lucas say? Lucas says that there's this one animal activist guy who studied physics and maths or something who says that when he goes out into nature, he thinks he, that the animals he sees are happy. Now, which of those would you call an emotional appeal if you had to give that label to one of them? <laughs> I think it's pretty clear this is the emotional appeal. Look, we've even got the image here that, to go with it, right, At, as well as the music in the background and the text scrolling along and the, you know, how is that not way more of an emotional appeal, especially using words like frolicking and playing and making love? Um compared to what, what Alex said, nor is it in any way an engagement with anything Alex said, because it's just like, well, forget about that. This guy saw animals and thought they looked happy. What? what? <laughs> How is this evidence for anything? Okay, but but maybe this isn't just the warm-up, because then he talks about the argument from evolution. So let's consider this. We're probably arguing for the above statement that most animals are happy most of the time. It's not just my observation, yeah, you because know, that's pretty much worthless, but also from evolution. Being happy is an important psychological state for animals in order to be healthy. I mean, I guess you could say that because, like, that's part of being healthy, right? Um, you know, when you're sick and when you're hungry and when you're scared, you're probably not going to be in the maximum state of health. So I, I guess I agree with that. But then, well, are animals, like, healthy in the fullest sense most of the time? A happy animal has not just a much better immune system. Uh, probably true. We know stress does impact the immune system. Uh, he or she is also active and inquisitive. Again, probably true. Like, if you're scared for your life, you're probably hiding away, not as inquisitive. Being a happy and content... Oops is a vital ingredient to procreate and to live safely along. Okay, I think he's lost me with this statement here. What does being happy have to do with procreation? Like, to, a, a lot of species produce, um, uh, maybe not so much mammals, but especially like, um, like reptiles, amphibians, and fish. They'll produce thousands of offspring, and most of them will die because of predation or be, because of they don't get food or they don't reach the you know, next um, place where they need, like the next different habitat they need to um, reach the next stage of their lifestyle or whatever. Um, and only a tiny fraction of them will, will actually get get to procreate. Um, that, now, that's a, a strategy, an evolutionary strategy that, that works in, you know, a certain combination of, of, of uh, environments and such. Being happy and content has nothing whatever to do with pr procreative success there, which is the point there. Um, now, in terms of mammals, which I suspect is probably the big focus of this, because when you go out into the wilderness, you're probably mostly observing mammals frolicking and so forth. So I, I guess all of the other, all of the fish and the amphibians and the reptiles and probably many birds and as well as never mind insects and whatever else. Uh, forget about those. But I, I, what what is the evidence that being happy has anything whatever to do with reproductive success? Reproductive success is how many babies you have and how many babies they have. And, you know, obviously they need to have food and they need to shelter and they can't die from disease. But, I mean, they can have disease, but they can't die from it before they reproduce, right? Th these are the key things. I don't see where happy happiness fits into any of that. Like what it, he's just saying here, being happy is a vital ingredient to procreation. It isn't. <laughs> Procreating and having enough food and so on is a vital ingredient. Where's this coming from? I have never heard this in evolutionary theory before. Hence, evolution, why is this in all caps? Evolution will produce animals who are mostly happy. The happiness and contentedness is a driver. It's a, it's a key motivator. It helps us to seek out food, to seek out shelter, um, to seek out, you know, mates, obviously, uh, and to seek out other things that we need to survive. Generally, animals are not going to have all of those things to the to the maximal or to the, even the sufficient extent. I mean, some, of course, will, and they may be happy, but most of them, most of the time, won't. How do we know that? Well, because most animals don't survive. Like, that's that's the whole point of evolution. The overwhelming majority of, of animals who are born do not survive and do not go on to reproduce, but instead, um, only the fittest, in the sense of most adapted to their environment, do so. And, and that means that all of those who are not most adapted, or I guess who are also just unlucky, will not have their, their needs to which happiness is a driver satisfied. Like they won't have all the water they need, all the food they need, or they won't be safe from predation, or they won't have shelter and such. And I, I don't think those animals are going to be that happy, but, you know, if if they're constantly frightened or if they're being eaten or if they're sick or if they, uh, you know, can't find water and all of these other things. It, it just, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Um, I, I'd like to see actual, you know, peer-reviewed studies that establish some relationship here granted animals are happy some of the time no denying that that wasn't 
the argument though, the argument is how do we explain the massive amount of suffering there is in the animal kingdom, in, in the wild? And the evidence against that is some animal rights activist telling us that he thinks animals are mostly happy in the wild because apparently he sees it when he goes camping or something. And this vague argument that for some reason being happy leads to reproductive success because it helps you with your immune system. Like what's the actual argument there? Again, let's think about this. Um, pleasure and pain and happiness are drivers to achieve the relevant um, states that animals need, like things they need for survival. Most animals don't achieve these to a very large extent because like most animals die, don't go on to reproduce. And therefore they're not going to be happy a lot of the time. Like I don't think animals are happy when they're predated, when they don't have enough food. So I, I don't, I just don't understand this. Um, let's continue. Of course, if you assume evolutionary theory, this makes complete sense, doesn't it? Happiness is the psychological state most conducive to survival, which is why evolution will produce happy animals. Rather than animals that are all sad and terrified because Alex believes them to be tortured day and night, which they obviously aren't. Hence the title of Baluch's article, Most Wild Animals Are Happy Most of the Time. Finally, Baluch states, It is true that most animals die a violent death in the wild, but that does not contradict the above statement. If I am killed today, I would still have lived a mostly happy life. Remember, I told you that while the issue of predation is a big deal for Alex, he misses the point completely and Baluch exposes plainly and clearly why this is so. The one, two or three minutes of pain an animal may experience before it dies does not negate the fact that it has led a happy existence for years before that. And by the way, there are trillions of animals who die year in, year out, out of old age or some sort of disease without experiencing any significant pain whatsoever. So let's... <laughs> disease isn't painful, boys. You heard it here. Boys and girls, excuse me. That is a really strange thing. And old age isn't painful either, apparently. What a strange, what a strange thing to say. Um, also, uh, yes, yeah, so predation. Apparently, predation is only aversive when you actually get eaten and killed. Apparently, all of the time you spend alert uh, on the watch, as many animals in the natural world have to do constantly for fear of um, fear of, of predators and, and running away from them. Uh, that's that wouldn't count. I mean, let's think about this. How do you feel when you're afraid? When you are in a situation where you feel threatened? Do you feel happy? Often not, right? <laughs> so, I mean, you know, obviously there's, there's more to it than that in terms of the animal kingdom, but there's no like there's no more details given here so the, the point is i don't i don't understand the argument here animals are w would be constantly alert and stressed and concerned or in their way of concern right uh, about uh, about predation and that's sort of the point here right it's not just when they're actually eaten and even then like do we expect an all-loving god to create a world that has predation in it like that's kind of nasty would you design a world like that where your creatures eat each other and they have to to survive like even that seems i think we can run a case there but anyway I, i'm so like there's obviously a lot more suffering that doesn't just go into that, that's not embodied just in the actual predation part the eating part but it's all the the lead up to it that's the probably the worst part let's put all the pieces together according to alex animal life is supposedly defined by pain a gloomy existence of endless torment in an earthly hell. He tells us that, of course, this is pretty much exactly what we'd expect to find if we assume that the all-loving and all-powerful God of Christianity does not exist. And he calls this Christianity's biggest historical problem. What is his case built on? Mainly on emotions. In contrast, Baloch shows, not by emotional appeal, but on the basis of his own observation, experience, and chiefly the scientific theory of evolution, that animal life is defined not by pain, but by pleasure, as evolution will produce animals who are are mostly happy, frolicking in the sun, playing, making love, resting, and enjoying themselves. You might describe this as an earthly heaven. So to say that Alex has gotten reality upside down <laughs> when he told us that animal life is defined by pain is an understatement. Actually, the exact opposite seems to be true, that animal life is defined by pleasure. Now remember, it's Alex himself who asserted that it is incalculably easier to account for the suffering on an atheistic worldview. What he meant by this suffering is the messy bloodbath we supposedly observe in the real world, which, according to Alex, is what we would expect to find if we assume that there is no God. Well, the only problem is that we don't actually observe this suffering in the real world, but only in the fictional world Alex has orchestrated for us in his emotional drama. What we do observe in the real world is that animals are, as science tells us, almost always content, suffering in only very rare occasions and happy most of the time. 
what science? He's got like one guy who it doesn't even seem to be a biologist who tells us this. Partly based on his own experience and partly based on a, a very vague evolutionary argument, which uh, I don't even understand. Uh, so I'm not convinced that science tells us any such thing. And um, I think there's lots of reasons to think to the contrary. I'm just going to finish out the video. Then Camille has a few points that he'd like to um, that he'd like to make. Apparently, uh, he, he disagrees with my take here. So I want to finish the stream out pretty soon, but I also want to finish out the video properly in case there's a nuance I've missed. So we'll do that Thus, first. If Alex is to apply his very own reasoning consistently, he would have to agree that it is incalculably harder to account for this happiness on an atheistic worldview, because it's the very opposite of what we'd expect to find if we assume that there is no God. At the same time, according to Alex's logic, it is incalculably easier to account for this happiness on a Christian worldview, because it is, as Alex himself tells us, exactly what we would expect to see if we assumed the existence of an all-loving and all-powerful God. That is, some level of suffering that we might not be able to fully explain, but most of all, happiness. So where does this leave us? It leaves us staring at the rubble of Alex's supposedly biggest case against Christianity, which has utterly collapsed under the weight of reality. A reality that is infused with far more beauty and goodness than Alex imagines. Or to borrow a term from the most prominent atheist thinker turned Christian in the 20th century, we may say that Alex's case has collapsed under the weight of glory. In other words, and I find this to be truly beautiful, Cosmic Skeptic, one of the biggest atheist YouTubers in putting forward his biggest case against God, has offered us and himself his own most powerful case for him. Now I submit it's on Alex to follow the evidence and the logic of his very own case where it leads. That is, to the cross of Christ where the God he tried to argue against supremely revealed who he is. The all-loving source of the beauty and goodness we and the animals get to experience in the world he created. If you enjoyed this video, can I... Wow, that is something else. Um, all right. Well, let's see what Camille has to say. Welcome, Camille. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, hang on. That's not what I wanted. That's better. Yeah, I don't want to keep you for long because I need to go f uh, leave frolicking in the sun with my offspring. <laughs> Um, but yeah, like uh, when people reply to this video, it's really interesting that they go after the idea that animals are happy most of the time and that them not being happy hinders in their procreation somehow. But I think that's 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 misdirect, right? Uh, so usually the di dialectic is about how much suffering animals experience and whether it's like a good depiction of reality to say that they are happy most of the time. But first of all, I don't think that's the real issue. The most important issue is why is there any animal suffering in the first place on the theistic worldview? Like what does God mm. get from permitting animals to suffer or causing animals to suffer, right? Because animals don't have a free will. Um, so even if like every animal was experiencing utopian existence all the time, but there was just one species that experienced predation or parasitism, that would be a problem for the theistic worldview, right? But, but when it comes to like what he said about animal happiness, it's important to realize that we would be probably talking only about higher level animals like birds, mammals, and stuff like that. Those kinds of animals do have psychological well-being, similar to people, you know, on, on, on various levels. So I think it's meaningful for to say that they experience happiness. Uh, they, some animals can experience depression, for example. And I'm not a zoologist, but my understanding is that, yes, like a, a lack of psychological well-being in animals is tied to them reproducing less which is true about humans as well. Like if you're suffering from untreated depression, chances are you're not going to have sex that often, which means you're less likely to have kids, right? So yeah, that's my understanding. So you think that his evolutionary argument is fundamentally correct then? Uh, yeah, I think that like on evolution, we would expect happiness to exist because it does fulfill an evolutionary function. Yeah. And I think it's the case that, like, if there is a, an animal that has psychological well-being, uh, but it's being deprived of that, of that well-being, one of the consequences of that is going to be the animal is going to be less likely to be produced. I think this is non-controversial. Like in, in zoos, for example, this is a big problem because if the environment is not suitable and the animals are experiencing essentially like psychological issues, right? 
then they are not going to reproduce. And that, as, as far as I understand, this is what zoos are dealing with all the time when they are trying to get, you know, species that are facing uh, extinction to, to reproduce. And it's important to realize that we are talking about like polar bears, pandas, you know, not about insects, for example, or fish, you know. Even though I think even in fish, like if you if you don't have your fish bowl, fish bowl set up properly, the fish are not going to breed. Um, yeah. So I think mean, that's my hot take, right? It's like when you exp uh, encounter this kind of argument, it's very important to laser focus on there being any animal suffering at all, uh, but just you know being skeptical about the claim of how much animal suffering there is relative to uh, animal well-being or like these kinds of incidental issues that that's not really the way the most effective way how to how to go around uh, around it yeah see the thing is that if theists make the argument that most animals are happy in, in the wild most of the time even if they acknowledge, well, I mean, they have to acknowledge that there's some suffering. I think most Christians are just going to be happy to say, oh, well, you know, there's some residual that God has his reasons for. I, I, I don't actually think that that is, well, let me put it this way. It, I think it, it, it defangs the argument a lot from what Alex is trying to make it, which is a very potent appeal um, to something where it's just another residual problem that the Christians, just many Christians are just going to file under, well, God has his reasons department. And so I, 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 sure. I, and I think it's, I'm not at all convinced that it is true that animals are sort of on balance happy a lot of the time. Um, I do take your point that there is, uh, I mean, there is a facet of psychological well-being that's certainly relevant to reproduction, certainly in higher animals. And the zoo point is absolutely true. Although, I, I, I mean, I mean, zoos are very complicated precisely because they're not a natural environment, right? So uh, I, I think that, I think that understanding the predation point and the fact that like predators are going to be hungry a lot of the time. And prey are going to be stressed a lot of the time because they're worried about being predated. Like that alone, I think, is if we consider our case, how do we feel when we're where we feel the danger and how do we feel when we're hungry? Obviously, that's not perfect. But I mean, I think alone that that draws us to a, a skepticism of these sorts of claims. Now, I, I don't think that we have very good knowledge about the like psycho. We don't have good knowledge about the psychological states of animals, period, especially not of wild animals, because they're very hard to study. And so, I mean, you know, I, I'm open to being wrong about this, but I, I certainly don't think that it's nearly as plausible evolutionarily as as being made out in, in this video here, um, or that like science shows that animals are in the wild are happy a lot of the time. I think if anything, there's a bias for some scientists to um, have a sort of a naturalistic fallacy. So Jane Goodall, who studied um, chimpanzees, I think is a an example of this because, I mean, she, she, I mean, she, she, she's, uh, made some controversial statements in the past, but I think that in her thinking, it's sort of clear. And I think that this guy that was mentioned here is another example of this, a bias towards saying that nature is good and we just need to leave the natural world alone, which may be true, but it doesn't, I mean, that's, that's a slightly different point, but it doesn't actually follow that animals are happy in their natural environment. And I think that, I mean, I'm part of a movement called effective altruism and something that effective altruists sometimes talk about is the problem of wild animal suffering this is this exact issue, right? That most most other people just don't even mention because we just think, oh, it's nothing we can do about it and too hard and we don't know and whatever. But but I take this seriously, right? I, I don't know exactly what the balance of pleasure and pain is in, in the um, in the natural world, but I'm not persuaded by, you know, the arguments that have been given by, by Lucas here. And and I think that it, it's, um there is a, the point I'm making is that we do have a strong bias, or at least a lot of people have a bias to wanting to think that the natural world is this sort of like, you know, uh, Eden, uh, where most animals are happy most of the time, and, and including particularly people who are really like animals and like uh, like um, spending time in nature. So, anyway, that's kind of my take. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, like, I think the question is like, where should the dialectic go uh, in response to a video like this, right? And and you're probably correct that if the picture that gets painted is that animals are happy most of the time, then theists are more, probably going to be more likely to just dismiss it, right? But I think. Yeah. I'm just wondering whether the mo like more effective response to that kind of reaction, rather than arguing about like how happy or unhappy animals are in nature, really, is just to drive home the point that on theism it's really unexpected to be mm. any animal suffering in the first place, right? So you you can you can very easily I think folk like you can very easily turn the attention to the theist. To that kind of consideration, if you, for example, say, well, let's imagine every animal is happy every, all the time, 
but that is just like one instance of predation. What is God getting out of that? <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to phrase it. Yeah, I agree. I, and I sort of mentioned this uh, a bit earlier when I said that, um, like, why does God why why does God make a world that has predation in it? Like, mm. that's pretty weird. <laughs> if he's yeah. all powerful, yeah. So I I think I take your point, and that does move away from having to push against the beliefs a lot of people I think like to have that the animals yeah, are because, quite like, happy. Yeah, because like discussing about like how much animals suffer. First of all, yeah, it's. It, it's it's very difficult to establish empirically, but yeah. also it's in the category of statements that are like almost so vague that it's pointless to even talk about it, right? Like, yes. Even in people, you know, like am I happy most of the time? Are people like around me yes. happy most of the time? That's really that is hard to, to quantify as well. It, yeah. Right? <laughs> uh, so, uh, so I just think like there there are much better better ways to respond to that video. But otherwise, I think it's uh, it was really goofy for him to. Uh, I think in general, he, it seems to me he likes self awareness. Uh, he likes what? Sorry. Uh, he, he likes uh, self. Oh, lacks self awareness. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think. Um, well, you make some good points. Thanks for jumping on, Camille. Um, yeah, I'm no gonna problem. Finish up soon, so I'll uh, I'll say goodbye and just make some summary comments. But thanks a lot. I appreciate your your points. Yeah. Um, look forward to you. more. <laughs> look look forward to more New Testament uh, analysis coming yeah. from your channel as uh, well. That's probably going to go go over better than this. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Bye. All right. Cheers. Thanks. All right. So let me just sort of uh, summarize a little bit. Uh, yeah, I think he's finished there. Uh, so what was I saying? Yeah. So I think Camille makes some good points. Um, it's probably good to emphasize the suffering that does occur, even if like putting aside the issue of how the balance goes, because that is actually hard to know. Although I, I am very unconvinced by the evidence that Lucas presented here. But anyways, um, yeah. Wh what does God get out of predation? Wh what is it that he likes about other uh, animals having to eat other animals to survive and those animals having to like run away from them and hide and, and so forth in order to not be eaten? God just likes the world to be that way. Well, may maybe you'd say, they'd say, well, no, he didn't like the world to be that way. Like he didn't set it up that way, but then the fall happened. Right. And then it just, you know, it just had to be the case because of the fall that, that animals eat each other now. But of course God made it the way like God set up the course of change such that when the fall happened, animals would start eating each other. So it's still, he wanted it to be that way. Like he could have set it up differently. So I don't think that actually answers any, any, any of the question there. Um, so yeah, maybe this is an interesting exercise in how the argument can be honed in a more precise way. Look, it doesn't matter if animals suffer more or less on balance th uh, than they are happy. Let's focus on why they eat each other. <laughs> why is that a thing that God likes there to be? I mean, and you know, other examples, one, one can multiply there. Um, I think this is a very disappointing response uh, to just say, well, look, animal suffering in the wild is not a problem because actually animals are mostly happy most of the time. And that's all there is to it. Um, no more nuance, no actual science shown here other than a vague appeal to evolution. Again, I'm happy to be proven wrong if there is quality evidence <laughs> that this is true. I think that there's very little evidence of this. As Camille pointed out, we don't even really know if this is true for humans or not, even though we have much better evidence for humans. Um, and most of the evidence that we do have of the psychological states of animals isn't in the wild because it's so difficult to study that in the wild. But I think we can make some plausible inferences on the basis of things like predation, disease, insufficiency of, of um, food and other resources, that there's a lots and lots of suffering in the natural world, um, irrespective of what the precise balance might be. And this is a major problem if the universe, including the natural world, was created by an all-loving, all-powerful, om omnipotent God. This is apparently what he likes to see uh, in, in the world is animals eating each other and ripping their heads off and, and all this other stuff. So, yeah, I, I don't think this is a very adequate response at all. Um, and I think that Deflate was really hypocritical in the way that he accused Alex of making emotional appeals and then making a whole bunch himself by, let's, let's tick him off the list, showing his son having music behind it, um, talking about all the qualifications of the person he was citing. Okay, maybe that's not emotional appeal, but it's like an appeal to authority. Um, and then the language that he used, including the bolding of the quotes and of the words in the quotes and all that sort of stuff. Um, and the like derisive language uh, tone that he adopted, which itself is a form of emotional appeal. Like talk about pot calling the kettle black. I don't mind emotional appeals as long as they are not like ridiculously over the top and are backed up by sound argument behind it. But when you accuse someone else of making emotional appeals and then do it yourself, that's pretty lame. So I'm, uh, you know, I, I, I can't help but be critical of that anyway. So, but um, yeah, so that was the animal suffering video. So let's just re recall the two other videos that I looked at this evening. The first one was that Coca-Cola proves that 
the women actually did find the empty tomb because no one would make that up, even though they actually would because they've got to explain why no one else had uh, talked about the story before. So, of course, women having found the tomb and then God or Jesus having told them not to tell anyone, well, that naturally fits into why no one's heard of it because no one would trust the women anyway. And then the second video we looked at was a story of a friend of uh, Lucas here who had a experience, despite being a, a massive skeptic, of experience of prayer working for him and that this shows us that you know we can have experiences that can change our minds i guess even though he's also said in the video that that wasn't what his point was even though that literally was what his point was. so i it's a bit, it was a bit confusing but that, that was the second video and then the third one we just saw now was about the fact that um wild animal suffering is not a problem for these and because animals in the wild are happy most of the time and the time that they're not happy well i guess that just doesn't count because reasons you know god, god just likes them seeing lions ripping you know heads off gazelles and whatever because you know adds to his glory i suppose all right so um that's it for wait how do i yeah so uh thanks for listening everyone hope this was kind of interesting this was just sort of an off-the-cuff stream i felt like doing because I, I found this new uh well he's not new but it was new to me that, that i found his his channel there um so yeah thanks everyone who came by thanks for the few donos and uh kind remarks the next uh, content that i'll be doing is on nathan's channel in a couple of days i'll be doing a stream with him of the bad apologetics uh series about what are we doing <laughs> the argument from reason and the evolutionary argument against naturalism so that's going to be an interesting one um just when I think the arguments can't get any worse, they somehow keep getting worse. <laughs> That's probably just confirmation bias. Anyway, but uh, so tune into that. Um, talk to you soon. Cheers.